Hello, I'm Stuart Craner, co-founder of Thinkers50 and director of the Business Ecosystem Alliance. Welcome to this Business Ecosystem Alliance webinar. Every month we bring you interesting discussion, insights, research and best practice from the world of ecosystems. So thank you for joining us today. As always, please feel free to offer your questions, thoughts and opinions during the session. And I'm delighted that today's session features three people with very distinctive perspectives on the organizational world. Ecosystems are frequently looked at through the lens of science, but fresh new insights can be gathered by looking at ecosystems in creative spheres. In this unique webinar, we have assembled an innovative trio of thinkers and practitioners from the world of music to look at the powerful role of ecosystems in the creation and performance of music. I'm joined by Rick Spann, Simon Martin, and Melissa George. Rick is a, an organizational consultant, applied musicologist, artist, and jazz mu musician based in Amsterdam. He is the author, with Simon, of Resounding, Introducing an Alternative Metaphor for Organization Change. Simon Martin is an organizational consultant, keen flugelhornist, and partner at Metalog Consultant. Uh, Melissa George is a leader of learning, anthropologist, linguist, artist, chef, gardener, passionate trail running, doctoral students, Renaissance woman. She joined us from Rabat in Morocco. Uh, Simon, Melissa and, and Rick, thank you very much for, for joining us. Um, Looks set for an interesting discussion because we've never really looked at ecosystems from, the, from this particular perspective, I, I think. Uh, so what, what does an ecosystem look like in the in the musical space? Rick, Rick perhaps you could have the, the, the first go. What it looks like, what it what it looks like, what it sounds like, it's more like um, well, a jumping off point might be that when you're listening to music, you're inside of an of an ecosystem. You're hearing connections between patterns, uh, melodies, harmonies, rhythms, tones, noise, dissonance all kind of like words and metaphors that, that, that really bring you into a world that is emerging around you. And of course, there are different ways of working in with composition or improvisation and all different aspects between that, that can give us very in, insightful ideas on how things grow, develop, uh, how we learn, how nature is learning, how nature is improvising, you know, this, this, this whole area of um, sounds, the harmony of the spheres, old philosophy on music, it's, it's a wide, wide field for me that's very connected with what an ecosystem is. Simon, you, you, you've written a book with Rick. How, how, how did your interest in this area develop? Where, where did it come from? Mm, well, I was thinking in connection with ecosystems of one of the first experiences Rick and I had, which was at a a workshop in in Berlin and a yoga studio on the sort of banks of the river Spray um, with Stephen Lakmanovich, a great teacher, educator, musician. And um, we were sat in in circles, you know, in, in almost a kind of physical ecosystem, if you will. And sort of Stephen made, I think, to remember strange buzzing noises and gestured at people and they were to start making sounds with their, you know, their voices. Um, and, you know, the information that we needed seemed to be contained within this circle of you know, people creating sounds and these most wonderful pieces kind of emerged and evolved and grew louder and uh, grew softer and, and found their own endings really so it was a you know almost like an ecosystem um a musical aesthetic ecosystem which contained all the information that was needed for something to emerge find its form and then kind of close together at the right time and yeah that was very interesting this idea of um you know, patterns as rick says and, and the pattern that connected um that organizational system um, of a group of people kind of sitting, making making noises with their with their vocal cords. Uh, and, and Melissa, how, how, how do you get here? Because you're an anthropologist, um, amongst other things. What's your interest in this this, this sphere? Yeah, thank you. Uh, well, what brought me to this conversation is my deep passion for leadership development and working in K twelve education, both public and private, the last twenty plus years. Um, I, I, I really have developed this, this keen interest and passion in figuring out how we might support the development for more effective change leadership. And so uh, Rick and Simon's book and, and meeting Rick through Fielding Graduate University is really what brought me into the mix here to look at 
you know, what can resounding as a metaphor offer um, leading in an international school context? Yeah, and the metaphors we normally are inspired by or organized by are tend to be mechanical or, or, or scientific. So this is a different approach. You would see it as, a, as part of a, a more organic, a different perspective on, on change leadership, Melissa. Absolutely. I think after reading the book and having several conversations uh, to start with Rick about this whole idea, you know, it brought for me a person who maybe the, I, I don't really play a, an instrument, but it, the, the idea of resounding and the ideas laid out in the book are quite liberating and invite this kind of exciting mix of dynamic play in an organization. And if we think about uh, ecosystem, um, that is what's happening, this dance and improvisation whether we're aware of it or not, it, it seems to be happening. And so this uh, resounding kind of offers a new paradigm to step into in our work together. Of course, the notion of improvisation is not a notion that uh, sits comfortably with a traditional organization in that they, they require organization and predictability and, 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 and planning. But your approach is the antithesis of that. Si Simon? Yeah, I mean, just thinking actually about our, our kind of route into exploring this this idea of sound. And I mean, it, it built on thinking that came before it, um, you know, ironically from the world of science, a kind of this idea of complexity science meets systems um, with kind of Ralph Stacey. And then a, a, a you know, colleague of Ralph's, um, Patricia Shaw, was particularly influential in this idea of um, your know, organisations being a conversational process and conversation being ultimately improvisation. So maybe that's a, a thought that can free us up um, you know, there's there's a sort of school of thought that exoticizes improvisation and you know makes it the you know, the realm of of you know, creative spirits somehow beyond the, the normal person. Um, but conversational improvisation is is going on um, all the time in in healthy systems and of course stuck conversations are, are happening too. Um, so I think that's a kind of uh, yeah an idea that that we were connecting. And if um, organisations are made of conversations, then that's a a sound based thing. Uh, therefore. If we want to change organizations and they're sound based maybe if we in, get interested in uh you know what the metaphor of sound might might open up um in our thinking um was yeah the question that, that we found interesting to to ponder i think anything that exoticizes organizations is a good thing i think also true yes anything that frees us from the sort of the, the mundanity of, of uh, yeah some of the thinking that, that we're stuck in uh, yeah it seems to be from the music world rick that there's two elements, the performance element and the, the, the creative element. Uh, and and I, obviously they, they can be fused together. Uh, but I suppose in the organizational world, it is performative as well and, and, can, be, and can, can be creative. Yeah, well, the idea, um, when you think of creative musicians and you think in, in terms of like creation, that you might think in terms of composition like i'm composing something but then again if you write that down and if you say this is the score and it should be done exactly like that then you're going to have an execution of a plan and it can be wonderful of course and you can and really you have to be attentive to what's going on and stuff but if you're like improvising uh like here in amsterdam we have a jazz a collective which is called the instant composers pool it's quite uh, old and legendary and what they do is sim simply they say we're composing instantly so we're in the moment and we're doing something, but we do not edit it yet. So it's the unedited reality that we're all in. And then that really requires a different mindset, but also a different uh, attitude towards spontaneity, taking risks, embracing errors, stuff like that, which also means that there's some anxiety there. And I think anxiety is a very interesting um, um, thing to, to raise in this context. Uh, when we have anxiety provoking things happening in an organization, if you think of it in an ecosystemic lens, well, that's just what, what leads to innovation. That's the tensions that we need between what is and what is becoming in the moment. And this openness to what is new and not dismissing that because it doesn't fit into the, the, the thing we have in mind, the score we have in mind, that helps to understand that we might jam on the edge of chaos like on the edge of what we have and the edge of what is emerging, which is about anxiety, which means 
okay, let's give each other some chance to take a risk and play with that. So mm. for instance, we prepared today to be unprepared <laughs> because the idea is for me, everything I planned before, I, I cannot use it. It's just a role for me in improv. If I think that's a cool thing to say, oh, now you shouldn't have thought about that because <laughs> now I can't use it anymore. Mm, and that, that anxiety, Rick, you're making me think about that in the conversational context again, because you know, quite often our organizational conversations can be quite safe. And maybe that's when we've slipped out of conversation as improvisation. Um, and maybe those really live conversations need a little bit of that quality of anxiety. You know, can I really give the feedback or really state my needs in a way that I don't normally feel able to do in this this meeting or this? this you know, yeah, I think you're right. that's an important ingredient to to show that something is is live and not just a stuck pattern. But there's a lot of fear in organisations, isn't there? I mean, the, yeah. Amy Edmondson's book, The Fearless Organisation, uh, portrays an ideal, really, because in, in, in reality, uh, organisations are, are fraught with anxiety and fear. Mm. But I mean, I'm just interested in how that plays out in a musical context, because, I mean, I, I guess there is fear and anxiety there as well. If you're, if you're in a, a jazz band and... The, the, lead, the leader has high expectations. You, you might be performing at the edge of chaos, but if you get it wrong, <laughs> you could lose your job in, in that world as well. Yeah, but sometimes people do. Like, uh, like Sonny Rollins, if you would, would listen to him, one night it could be wonderful, the other night it really might, uh, might be terrible. And that's the part of the game. Otherwise, you're still playing uh, sure. Like, uh, uh, so... You really don't have a guarantee about how it's going to be turning, turning out. And then it's about accepting that as a group and knowing, okay, this might be a bad night, but, well, you, you uh, went out on the limb. Mm. And, and when you don't do that, yeah, then you might think, okay, now we're going to be successful. <laughs> yeah, but you're also successful when you're not successful, but when you're succeeding. And Sonny Rollins is an interesting example for those... I guess when, when there's fear in a system, um, we look very creatively for sort of safety mechanisms, I think, don't we? And sort of your repeated formulaic behaviours, things that were safe before, uh, you know, often often feature in that. And then you know, Sonny Rollins had a big hiatus in his playing career where he famously went and practised on the Williamsburg Bridge because he was frustrated in noticing that he was reaching for the same musical patterns in his solos. So somehow he got stuck into these safe patterns um, and he realized that that lacked, you know, the the edge or the life that he was looking for in a, a true improvise, improvisation. So yeah, even a, as advanced an improviser as Sonny Rollins needs to you know, keep an eye out for those stuck repeated patterns that, that aren't always helpful. How, how does this relate to your idea of dynamic play, Melissa, do you think? Well, um, yeah, I'm thinking about it from the lens of, being a school leader in an international school context right now and that dynamic play is it, it can be an interesting one um having worked in many different countries which offer up a you know wide range of cultural contexts and settings uh, values and patterns um when i've been inside a school organization in different places in the world um this dynamic play um, gets expressed quite differently depending on the culture of the organization, which is, in my experience, almost always been influenced by the local context and culture. So there's the organizational culture influenced by the local culture. And oftentimes I don't think people that are swimming in the mix of this and playing together through their interactions and their work together um, understand just how much that cultural um, context that we're living and working in does infiltrate and influence uh, the work we do together. And oftentimes I hear themes that uh, people find frustrating and the dynamic play of our work uh, show up are the very same things that people find frustrating with the culture. And it's all because of the lens they're bringing on with their own playing. And so, um, yeah, it, I, I mean, just to go back to just fear and organizations, um, I think it's a real, it's a, it's a real deep topic to explore. And, and yet, um, I know Rick and I have talked about this idea of, um, going through complexity and coming out the other side to simplicity. And 
getting people to have ex an experience where they they find joy in the dynamic play of their work together and somebody in the system or ecosystem or a group of people, even if it's just one person starts with creating that safety of that structure through a resonance and their relationships with the people around them. I think that slowly spreads because people are going to resonate with this type of safety and creative play. Maybe there's some resistance as well. And that's also could be a sign of, working through the complexity. So I don't know if I'm making any sense, but. <laughs> yeah, I don't, don't worry about that, Melissa. <laughs> yeah. the, but I think the simplicity, complexity, uh, the way they play off against each other is really interesting because in, in the arts, when you think of the great artists like uh, Picasso or, or great musicians, uh, Miles Davis, their capacity to do for, for simplicity is, is what makes it beautiful and it's the same in sport isn't it the great the great mm -hmm. soccer players you don't look at uh, messi or ronaldo thinking they're making the game more complicated mm -hmm. and, and the reverse is true in organizations you often get promoted for you're more likely to get promoted for over complicating rather than over simplifying absolutely and i'm thinking of, of mars davis in particular and sort of space and silence you know whereas the expectation of a virtuosic trumpet player might be more notes more volume um he was very good at sort of knowing when to to lay out, to remove, to step back. And yeah, again, making the link as you've done, Stuart, to organization here. Yeah, I think the expectation of leaders is, is quite often that they play more notes and more loudly. Um, and sometimes it's surprising if there's a moment of silence or pause and, and perhaps we need more of that. You know, sort of simple strategies for stepping into complexity in a way that's perhaps a bit more, um, I know, right, right for doing something good with it. Yeah. What, what's I think uh, an important <clears throat> thing to understand is that in, for instance, in jazz, we have minimal structures. So we have a blues scheme or an ABA standards a score or, uh, you know, there are uh, quite um, clear, simple uh, guidelines or structures or constraints within which to improvise. Uh, and in an, in an organization, this, for instance, might mean that we can go all the way in a way, we can play with things, we can improvise, we can experiment, we can be on the edge of chaos. But for instance, if we have an, what we call an upstream conversation on tone, what is the tone of, a, of an organization, then you might have a talk about the underlying values. How does it connect to sustainability, to corporate social responsibility, to the triple bottom line? If you have a talk uh, around that early on, and then you move into like drifting apart, getting back together, getting back together quite often to all bring it back to the center, play with that. Then there's some way of connecting it, which is not really, really tangible, tangible or measurable, but it really makes sense because it connects to the whole human being instead of only, well, the traditional ways of thinking about a heady way of organizing. Mm. A few comments and questions are coming in. Uh, Gemma Boyd, thanks for, for your comments, comments Gemma. Uh, Gemma says, composition for me is organic and, and, and instinctive as a musician, writer, and artist, and, gar and gardener. But I suppose that's a perennial debate in the organizational world. Uh, mm. The role of instinct, and because you're making, you're making instinctive judgments all the time in your organizational life. Mm. But it's, it's kind of unfashionable, isn't it? Because uh, organizations expect the data to, to back it up. Mm. And we, we got interested in, in that sort of side of things a little bit when we were thinking about this idea of sound metaphor and using the arts to kind of perhaps open up different ways of thinking about organisation. And every now and again, we got a bit sort of paranoid. Is this legitimate? And one thing that helped us was um, Heron and Reason's idea of there being four different ways of knowing in organisation. And you know, the common ways of knowing are propositional. They're sort of management textbook type things. They're formulas or business planning templates. Um, but there are other routes to knowing you know, the experiential, the sort of phenomenological route, but also the artistic route into knowing. And perhaps those two are a bit nearer that, that kind of instinct. Um, and maybe we need all of them, um, but perhaps we recognise that often we favour you know, the textbook, the, the business school template over you know, the gut feeling or the extra brushstroke added or not added at that last minute. Um, so, yeah, I think it's a, it's a tension, but it probably needs redressing in most organizational cultures. Yes. Yeah. Also, also to, to Gemma, yeah, that's um, 
everything we say about music uh, doesn't make sense because it's something beyond words. Like, and the same with dance. Like, uh, um, who was it? Isidore Duncan said, uh, if I could explain, when people are asking you, what, what do you mean when you're dancing that? She said, well, uh, if I could um, explain what it meant, I wouldn't have to dance it. <laughs> so um, it, the intuition, like uh, you, you play with something and you, it's a process and it's really deep and it's really personal. And I really enjoy how you express that when you say composition and improvisation and you put it against each other. That again is <laughs> getting out of what music, like an adjective music thinking might be. It's all just in the in-between, I guess. But the organizational world, you know, the commercial world is always seeking out the explicable, I guess. Yeah way of explaining that um Gemma also says so much over complication these days so people spend more money just adds to overwhelmingness simplicity in jazz can be more meaningful yeah. I, think, I, think we're, I think we're all with you there Gemma mm. and it's sometimes yeah. it's um that's hard to explain isn't it it's, it's perhaps the difference between um you know operating from a particular stance versus having particular tools if that makes sense you get a lot of complicated tools that are on offer but pr perhaps what I, th I think Gemma's talking about and she'll tell me if I'm wrong is this this idea of an orientation to sort of simplicity or that kind of instinctual mindset that I think you were talking about Rick and and also the what you were talking about Melissa in terms of that sort of dynamic play stance that you were talking about sort of w you know, experiencing that in lots of different organizational cultures informed by their local cultures but I imagine that kind of curious stance remains the same throughout Nick Beeson says, recycles the Frank Zappa quote, talking about music is like dancing about architecture. Nice. <laughs> I didn't know that one, but I shall remember that. Which is, yeah. which is a very funny line, and thank, thank you, Frank Zappa, for that. But yeah. um, I, I'm, not, I'm not sure that's actually true. Because I, th I think it's necessary to have conversations about music and, and art and, and whatever. Anyway, um, and Alex Pezjak, thank you for your comments. He says, tone equals principles. And principles equal the freedom within a framework. It is intuitive, simple, and works in large organizations. I've worked with such a framework for 10 years. And yeah. how do these ideas go down in organizations? When, when, when you talk, enter an organization for the first time and they, they want to talk to, to you about working with you, what, what, what's the, the, the usual response? I mean, I think if I, if I jump in there, it almost connects to that stance versus you know, methodology question uh, as well. So I think what we were exploring in the conversations the three of us have been having around this subject is a is a question um, about how do we find fresh ways of thinking about organizational problems because we often get stuck in our own, own ways of thinking. Um, and sound was just an interesting enough metaphor, but it could just as easily have been cooking or, or gardening. Um, so I think it's more that kind of curious stance, that dynamic play stance that's behind it. So um, you know, I, I don't think it's a case of going into organizations and putting people through a sort of resounding program, as it were. Um, but in this idea of conversation as improvisation and you know, the idea that organizations might have their own particular sounds that we could listen for, then depending on the context, um, you know, the challenge that's being worked on, you can ask yourself different questions. What's the, you know, if, if it's around team development, what's the, so what's the sound of my team? Let's play with this metaphor. Is it a heavy sound? Is it a light sound? Are there lots of notes? Um, you know, is there trauma? Is there heavy silence? Uh, and if we can begin to listen in to what's going on, um, you know, what other options might there be um, for action? And we were sort of informed a little bit in getting to that idea by um, you know, a phrase from Otto Sharma talking about organizational consulting being about helping the system sense and see itself. So this idea, it was a gestalt idea of paying attention to what is rather than worrying about point B in the first instance. And then we noticed that's a very visual metaphor. So what happens if you flip it into sound? So again, I think it's sort of stance rather than methodology, um, if that makes any sense. There's a, an interesting comment from Frank Karlberg, and thank you very much, Frank. Mm -hmm. And he says, on page 44 of the fascinating book, Entangled Life, he learned that fun fungi use their senses quite a lot. And he also <laughs> organisms self-organizing continually re remake themselves. On the other hand, machines are built and maintained by humans. So two questions. As we learn from fungi, what can we do to use our senses more and focus more on organizing and less on organizations? <laughs> uh, Melissa, are you a fungi expert? 
<laughs> no, not necessarily. <laughs> but, um, I, I think I think what we're getting to is, is, is metaphors to explore our senses and therefore understand organizations more 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 powerfully, perhaps. Yeah, and I think that's a rhizome metaphor is very interesting as well. Yeah. Sort of going under the that's ground actually. and sort of sensing. My my attention in that question, I was, well, I was drawn to the detailed referencing, which was very impressive. But um, yeah. but that idea of you know the shifting the focus from organisation to organising, and that sounds like a little thing, but I think it's quite a fundamental thing, really, which probably takes quite a lot of you know, reflective personal development work because. Um, yeah, we're very tempted to, to you know to like to be able to pick things up, put them down, and they stay there. It's a bit sort of unsatisfying to think about an organisation as something that's constantly shifting and moving, um, particularly if you're paid uh, or you think you're paid to control it. So I think that move you know to organising and accepting the fact that this thing is constantly shifting and evolving, um, and we come across it a lot in things like organisation design work. I mean, that's quite a uh, yeah, a big job. Um, uh, and it's quite anxiety provoking and it's quite time consuming and most leaders would be quite happy if at some point it was done. Um, but the, perhaps the more helpful recognition is that it's never really done. Um, and that's quite overwhelming to accept, but also probably quite freeing and empowering if we can you know, it, it do the work of you know, making sure that we, we stay attentive to this thing that's evolving rather than delude ourselves that, yeah, we're done for a bit now and we can rest. Yeah. Um, uh, I remember, sorry, I, I remember in our conversations, which were quite playful with uh, Simon, I wrote down this thing called Fleur and Dirt. You remember that one, uh, Simon? I don't, I don't remember in detail. Yeah. No. Fleur and Dirt, for me, it's just an acronym for Fleur means facilitate learning in real time, and uh, Dirt means design in real time. And wow. it was just an, <laughs> an idea of playing with that, and you said it would be like in a Scandinavian. Uh, <laughs> Deserve or something like that, some some furniture. But the idea of designing in real time, like uh, the fungus and the rhizome, the rhizome is so very interesting because it's this root structure underneath that's connecting all the trees in a way that you cannot see, see and perceive, but and it has no beginning or ending. But it's connecting everything in a way that you cannot see the tree as something just by itself, but see the connectedness. So there are very interesting uh, studies on rhizome and jazz, for instance, or other improvised art forms. Mm -hmm. Interesting. And uh, Nick makes the comment, uh, he said he's interested in the relationship of fear and being driven back into instinctive patterns, loops and reels, and how safety and confidence enable innovation and novel imp improvisation. I, I, I guess, Melissa, that change requires some degree of safety and confidence. Yeah, <clears throat> I think it plays a role in an ecosystem. Uh, we think about, you know, we all need some kind of structure and stability to grow and change and stretch into the unknown. And so sometimes having those familiar fallbacks is part of the, the process. And um, I, I wanted to touch on just briefly this idea of um, how much more meaningful verbs are to us than nouns these days because they seem to capture a lot more of a process and a dynamic. I've noticed, uh, at least in my field, uh, a lot of job titles have switched from director of a noun and a noun to a verb. For example, my role traditionally in schools used to be understood as a director of curriculum and instruction. And uh, that's shifted now. Um, we're calling ourselves directors of teaching and learning, which mm. encompasses so much more than the static thing called instruction and curriculum it's um so so i think this this shift that's happening uh, is going to involve moments and times in our organizing where we fall back on former ways of organizing because they're familiar to us and this connects with a conversation i've had with rick before about um rick correct me if i'm wrong it's a musical term but you know syncopated leadership and having some of that that familiar um come back to or a cycle to kind of push off of as well if we think of gardening and plants and an ecosystem need some sense of structure sometimes to hmm. hold, hold that, themselves together that's a good example maybe to tell how practically uh, this thing works like if we frame our work not in a diagnostic but in a dialogic way we're going to open up conversations on what you hear helping the system sense and hear itself then we got this idea on syncopation so very shortly if you got a 
a beat in a in a band you play like so you keep in the beat if you play with syncopation you add a, a little accent just before the one the first so it's between the beats and that a, a good jazz drum is doing that he's keeping the beat and at the same time is like ah nudging the people a little bit or uh, supporting them when people do something weird or something strange but if it's if people get stuck in their patterns then you might as a drummer do so people really sense hey i'm on that edge i'm not getting stuck but i'm also not really dissolving uh, the, the whole band is, is falling apart because i'm just doing my own thing and then syncopated leadership just might be something to ask people listen to this and i can show that or play with that where's the syncopation in your own in your own team is is it where do you play around where do you uh, try to disrupt these patterns that are getting a bit stuck and where are you feeling at ease with disruption anyway something that is unexpected and surprising is a good thing mm. and it frames it almost as small conversational leadership acts you know, you're not looking to kind of cause your team to explode you're causing that little nudge aren't you that little nudge to the rhythm of the team in in whatever way is helpful or adds more interest i think i think the role of leadership in all this is interesting because uh the, the way leadership in ecosystems is is a, is a different um kettle of fish to leadership in hierarchical organizations and I, I wonder if the lessons to be learned from uh, leadership as it is exercised in, in in the world of music so i was thinking i think it's somebody like duke ellington in a in a leadership capacity or leader of a, a music group of any sort a number of people uh, watching have made comments about leadership uh mm. Gemma says leaders may have more control if they're less controlling and let employees flourish involved in and evolve into their strengths uh, and she and Alex have also talked about the um, the leader as an orchestrator mm. um, and kind of lead or a conductor of, of an orchestra. So it's a, it's a new kind of understanding of leadership is integral to exploring these metaphors. Mm. And, and you mentioned Duke Ellington, first of all, and obviously a phenomenal pianist, phenomenal composer. Um, so if you thought of those maybe as his kind of what he got hired for as a leader his main source of expertise and positional power um but i think actually what the secret that he had was keeping his band together because i think he had the, you know, the, the the band that was together the longest on the road uh and you know, his behind the scenes skill was you know fostering an environment where very difficult characters could just about coexist um and he was already you know almost a psychologist really in knowing um how to let this group of people get along and um, I think he had, I forget who it was, was it Charles Mingus um, really acted up at one stage and he said to him, Charles, I never fire anyone from my band, so I'm afraid you're going to have to resign. Um, but for the most part, he managed to keep really quite a motley crew of, of very different characters together um, without that being the thing he was famous for, perhaps. Mm. Yeah, and speaking to the uh, what I just read, um, Duke was not writing for uh, an instrument, he was uh, writing for the players. So if you had Cooley Williams, that, that was this guy who was playing like a bit of a jungle style, wah, wah, stuff like that. So then he would play something that was connected with his or his personal style instead of I'm, I'm going to do something for, for trumpet or whatever. So then the composition was concerto for Cooley. You know, and that makes quite a difference if, if I would be a leader of a group and I would really pay attention to who are the people in my group and where are their talents and how can I calibrate the challenge for them? How can I compose something or compose uh, like um, a minimum structure where they can expand, but in a way that it's like connected with appreciative inquiry also, right? What is this little notch, this little um, universe that I could come up with to help someone spread his or her wings? I'm thinking almost of um, the anthropologist's kind of curiosity, Melissa. I don't know what you would make of this, of just what is this bunch of human beings that I've got in front of me and what can they do and how can I get the best out of them? Yeah, if you see a, a music teacher, if, if any of you have ever gone to a school musical performance, uh, I'm always amazed at how incredibly patient and tolerant these music teachers are and how well they set the stage for parents' expectations on the night of their first concert. You know, they, they, they really 
you know, set the expectation of these are these are students learning how to play an instrument and play music together for the first time. You're going to hear squawks and squeaks and, and sounds. And this this is part of the journey. And they have come so far. And and so that really unites everyone to be quite appreciative of what's happening, even though it may not sound beautiful, that kind of frame uh, of here's where they're at in their development and their journey of playing music together actually makes it beautiful because you realize the, that they've never been on a stage together the first time they're learning how to hold the instrument. They're figuring out so many things all at once, uh, let alone who they're going to be in the world or who they want to be. So that's just another example from a, a school context. Um, that sounds like it was beautifully done. So it just reminded me of um, my brother's school uh, and it wasn't quite so well achieved, but the announcement was, ladies and gentlemen, I would recommend this evening you listen with your hearts and not your ears. <laughs> and, and, Rick, and that links very neatly sorry rick to um, a comment from yanis who uh, says uh, i adore nora bateson's idea of exploring by crossing the senses in a way that we make space for new senses to emerge and new possibilities and impulses also emerge so it's kind of a mixing the the, the senses so texture and, and taste and i think that's really what the the three of you are encouraging people in yeah. organizations to do yeah, absolutely. I mean, you mentioned it at the start, I think, Stuart, about the sort of machine metaphor and its dominance. But um, yeah, there are so many things that become sort of dominant. And I think almost any alternative way of looking at or hearing what's going on in organisations is helpful in, in unsticking. And, and we began in the bit of writing we did with this question of sound. But by the end, we were very interested in the sort of the embodied. Um, uh, and I think yeah, we're all recognising that yeah, almost yeah, the gardening, the, the mycologist, all of these different perspectives, uh, uh, you know, have interesting things to tell us about organising, and we, we refer to it as the almost the Batesonian instinct. I think was a phrase that we we hit upon in the writing. This idea of putting things that you know didn't belong together in inverted commas next to each other and seeing what sparked between them. It's the instinct that's behind sort of metaphor in poetic writing as well. Um, but you see that quite a lot in in Bateson's career, ranging across different academic spheres, um, which was sort of frowned upon because it didn't really work. You know. You're supposed to stay in one curriculum area and not wander off to another one and see what was interesting over there. So, yeah, I think that that instinct, as, as Yanis says, to kind of move through the senses, move through different frames and lenses is is only healthy and also enormous fun. Uh, Bates and also we quoted that one, I guess. Uh, uh, we have been trained, this is a quote of Gregory Bates, we have been trained to think of patterns with the exception of those of music as fixed affairs. It is easier and lazier that way, but of course, all nonsense. So dynamic affairs, you know, the patterns are constantly evolving and riffing on what you were just saying, uh, Melissa uh, and, and Simon. At a, at a school uh, performance, kids are playing, you know, the audience is cheering. They might say, yeah, they might say, woo. And that's also about co-design, zooming out and taking the audience in, as participants into what's evolving which means that if I improvise and I hear some, someone saying, woo, you know, I might remember that, maybe just sense that, and later on it might emerge in the song or in the composition. So this is also opening up the field. Mm. Some, some good comments coming in. Uh, Rashmi, thank you for your, your lent, lengthy comments. Uh, and, and thank you for referencing uh, Don, Donnell uh, Meadows, whose work I don't know, but perhaps I should. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And he says the role of organizations to, is to ensure that the organism is 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 able to perform in spite of the often diseased state it persists in, often by leveraging the ecosystem. So kind of uh, organizations have to succeed in spite of the, the context they're surrounded with, perhaps. Uh, Joan Lurie suggests we need to develop organizational eco, eco, ecologists. Mm, yeah. Uh, Justin Timmer says, I think many of the metaphors are about the dynamics of interactions, the way feedback flows and how actors, people, instruments mix and what kind of patterns, creations they make. Yeah, wonderful, Justin. Yeah, I think that's quite, that's quite a nice uh, summary. Uh, Joan Lurie said, the role of a leader is to create the conditions for the systems they are in to be able to continually discover and disrupt the patterns they are in. Mm -hmm. So then the I suppose that's the role the role of leadership again. Kind of the the leader leader as a disruptor. While yeah. not forget, while not forgetting, sorry, that, that uh 
also in jazz, but in not what in many other styles, leadership is a verb and it's flowing through a system. So if I'm taking a turn as a as a jazz soloist, I'm the leader, and Stuart, you being a wonderful drummer, might be comping me, accompanying me. But then you get a solo because in jazz you always also bring the rhythm section into the conversation, and then you are the leader, and I'm accompanying you. So it's not a fixed position. Maybe convening, a, 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 the art of convening is very important. Miles is bringing people together. But when they start playing, then when John Coltrane's playing, he's the leader of the band. Hmm. What, what about the notion of the solo? I mean, the, the, at the heart of any idea of ecosystems is a, a sense of community. Yeah. And, and, and I wonder about the role of the, the individual leader or the, the solo in, in jazz, which can, can be at times. Mm. Just crackled for a second there, Stuart. But, um, I guess the solo, but the solo is supported by by the rest of the ecosystem, uh, and hopefully, if it's a good solo, it builds on information that's contained within the system already. So it's already been. If it's a bad solo, then it's something that's been thought through before, just to kind of you know demonstrate that top C that you can hit really cleanly, and that's actually you know might be impressive. Um, so Ronnie Scott used to say, I, "Yeah, I listened to that solo. I, I found it very impressive. I just didn't like it very much." <laughs> thank, thank you, thank you, Ronnie. <laughs> the um, there's been lots of comments about the, the, the nature of complicate. I'm trying to find the Dean Miles, who's an executive coach, says there's a difference between complexity and complicatedness, yeah. and it's an important one. Complexity is necessary to accomplish many of the hard things we need to do today. It's the result of intricate systems and processes coming together to achieve a specific goal. Complicatedness, on the other hand, is something that should be avoided. It's the result of unnecessarily convoluted systems and processes that make it difficult to understand what's going on and how to achieve a specific goal. Mm, that, that makes me think, because we were just talking about solos, of leaving the spaces and the silences in the solos rather than adding all the semi-quavers that you don't necessarily need, that maybe obscure the melody rather than adding to it. Um, and yeah, the that the previous quote that was talking about paying attention to movement and flows, I thought that was that was interesting. This idea of it's your point, Melissa, really. It's the it's the words with ing on the end rather than the kind of abstract nouns. It's yeah, and, and this idea of um you know, that we are all participating in organizations and you know, we might be a, a leader. Um, so maybe our gestures and responses are are louder in the system, but I think it's there's quite a nice democratic idea that you know we're all participating in the sort of ingness of what's going on. Um, what, what about the I mean, Rick's point uh, about the audience being involved? And I think Frank Carlberg makes the point. I like the point Rick said about making the audience as participants and contributors. Do you have another example of musicians who work on enlarging the ecosystem and increasing the number of stakeholders, contributors? Yeah, you might think of, for instance, styles merging. Like Bossa Nova was a style uh, that uh, it's, which should, simply means new wave. It's just new wave music with that in Brazil. And it was about jazz and samba. So you have communities. You have the jazz community and they play in certain ways and then you got the samba. Uh, and then you might, there might be purist bands who say, oh, we jazz people, we are playing jazz and we don't like anything else, which in my, for my idea, it's not real jazz it's because it's always about crossover and world music in a way. But then you play together. So you just imagine you're playing uh, in, a, in Rio de Janeiro and then uh, with, a, with a, a summer band and then a jazz uh, a flutist is coming along and she's playing and somehow they're open to pick it up, you know, and music is changing and something new emerges. Then you connect whole networks. Suddenly, uh, everyone from the jazz community in a way might be connected with everyone in the samba community and then we reconnect again, we resound again into the musicians that we were originally were as a group in the first place. But then it's not only the audience, but also everyone around it, everyone in the networks feels okay. Wow, this is cool. We like this new twist on our music, but this twist is simply coming from another type of music that is like merging with. There's a nice, there's a nice comment on responding to Simon's earlier comment about the sound of your team and organization. Dorianne, who's uh, watching in France, says, I remember reading an article a long time ago about a jazz group that would go to spend a couple of weeks embedded within an organization. And then they played the music of the organization at the end of the two weeks. What a beautiful idea. 
Mm. Yeah. And getting in touch with that intuitive knowing and that the phenomenology of spending time in that organization, I guess, as well. But I wonder, I wonder what most organizations sound like. Are they, are they just endless solos? But, uh, I've been in meetings that are like that. <laughs> I don't know if I would expand it to organizations. I'm sure we all have. But. Yeah. So and, and endless solos that Ronnie Scott wouldn't like. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's a good, good, good example. I mean, we've all been to meetings where you, you know, people are reporting back um, and you get the sense that no one is changed by anything they've heard. They've prepared their five minute segment. Um, and you know, that's very much like a sequence of bad solos because no information from any one contribution affects any of the other bits of information that are delivered. Um, yeah, so I, I, you know, I think some meetings do sound like a lot of bad solos. Um, and, you know, maybe that's an idea that, that suggests some areas for work. Yeah, uh, Keisha makes a comment. When the ecosystem seems stifled, it's at the feet of the conductors, of the conductor, which I, I guess is true. And uh, Dorian says, alternatively, if you think about a conductorless ensemble, <laughs> there's so many comments and they keep moving as I'm reading it, such mm -hmm. as in classical chamber music, there is a concept of co-inspirers rather than leaders and followers. Mm -hmm. And I think if you look at you know, the idea of orchestras and conductors, I'm sure there are numerous case studies of pretty interesting and not entirely wholesome organizational cultures in orchestras around the world. So, so uh, how far in your experience, Melissa, are, are we away from having decent conversations and people listening to conversations in organizations? Uh, yeah, that's an interesting question. Um, and I, right now my mind is thinking about also the conversations that are trickling in the comments about leaders and followers. And I do think there are help, helpful language labels to use. I, I, I just think that um, our idea of the, the leader being like a hero or heroine um, who's responsible for everything, I think is not going to work anymore. I, I, I think I prefer this notion of thinking of leadership as a system, as an ecosystem, that the best leaders know when to be followers. They know when to support uh, solos and expression from the group that's beautiful and inspiring. And followers, um, I think good leaders see the potential in followers to develop their le their leadership capacities, and they, they nurture that. And and so for me, leadership and followership uh, are a relationship and they go together well. And I, I know, um, you know, we don't talk a lot about followership. We talk mostly about leadership because it's more glorified, but it's, um, it's the whole system. And, and I think, gosh, we have a lot of work to do. I know at least in my context, you ask about the conversations and sometimes the, if, I, if I brought the idea of music what kind of music are we playing together? If we take out all of the sound and the language we're using, um, it's not sounding very good at times. And <laughs> so, you know, I'm always looking for some ways to improve the harmony or notice different tones that might show up. And, and this is coming from me, a non-musical background, but um, I do find it very helpful for being more nuanced and, and, and noticing more what's going on in the system around me and what I might turn the volume up on or what sounds am I bringing into the room? And um, yeah, do we need to add complexity or do we need to tone it down and, and simplify it a bit? So mm -hmm. we're, we're, out, we're out of time, um, but what, what would you like people to take away from this, Rick? What, what, would, you, what, what would you like people to think about when they, get, when they go to work in their organization tomorrow? <laughs> Yeah, uh, complexity is simply richness. It's simply rich, and sometimes you have to uh, shield something. I, that's not our thing. But it's be, being very, very interested in. We we work with human beings, and there are everyone's a musician. You don't need an instrument for that. So really, pay attention to what emerges from really listening generously. What's what's happening here? And then understanding that we're not uh, we're not like machines <laughs> or stuff like that. Which is we, we all have all, all kinds of talents and hang-ups <laughs> and all kinds of shit, you know, that's happening inside here. And simply be curious about that. Of course, within the context of where you're going and what you want to do with your, for your organization, but paying attention to who we are as human beings. There's so much richness in there beyond talents, but richness, creativity, and just uniqueness. Um, so listen to that, I would say. 
Uh, final word, Simon? Yeah, I think just take any of the ideas that have particularly been coming through the comments and, you know, uh, hold it in mind as you go into your next meeting or your next conversation and see what you notice, see what you hear, see what elements of the fungi or the rhizome is is playing out in that and just be, be curious and playful with these metaphors and it, it won't harm and it will certainly be fun. Yeah. yeah. As, as Christoph says in the final comment, let's start with listening. I think that that's uh, li listening is probably the most underestimated part of music. Yeah, sure. Absolutely. Well said, Christoph. Thank you very much, Melissa. Thank you very much, Simon. And, and thank you very much, Rick. I'll check out Simon and Rick's book, Resounding. It's uh, avail available now. If you want more information, uh, ch check them out. Uh, next month on June the 13th, we'll be looking at the role of standards and certification in furthering best practice with Martin uh, Moll, Marcus Magnus Carlson, and Andreas Holmer. Thank you, everyone, for joining us today. Thank you, Rick. Thank you, Simon. Thank you, Melissa. Welcome. Cheers. Bye-bye.